Hi, Forrest Tanaka, and I'm here just uh, near the town of San Gregorio, and I'm going to be taking a deep space astrophotography photo. And uh, it's a pretty involved process, and it involves a couple of things. One is, uh, in this particular case, I'm not going to be using a tracker, which simplifies things and complicates things. And I'm also going to be using stacking. So. First, let's take a look at the issue of not using a tracker by taking a look at what trackers are. And then we'll take a look at what the issue of stacking is. Taking a picture of anything in the sky aside from the sun and the moon is going to take a pretty long exposure because everything else is pretty dim. Now, professional observatories do this by controlling the telescope with a couple of computer-controlled motors that move the telescope in perfect synchronization with whatever it is that they're photographing. A lot of home telescopes have trackers built into them too, with a computer that lets you align to the stars and then it'll automatically uh, track its way across the sky as the Earth turns. The problem with a lot of these home trackers is that they're not really good for astrophotography. Uh, they may not be accurate enough, or they may just use the wrong kind of tracking for astrophotography. And so you can either get a better tracker and a different tracker, or you can just not use a tracker at all, which is what I'm going to do for this video. So on stacking, think about the old days of astrophotography when people like Henrietta Leavitt were examining glass plate negatives of stars and other objects. Now imagine you stack these glass plates together of the same part of sky. Then these stars get darker and darker as you stack them up. And when you finally develop the stack, you get bright stars on a black sky. Well, that's all a nice theory, but what about digital astrophotography? Well, every sensor has a matrix of tiny light detectors called photosites. And each one holds a certain amount of light that's converted to a value. And let's just say it's an 8-bit value from 0 through 255. As photons hit a photosite, its value increases but you need a certain number of photons to make the value increase by one. So that brings up two issues with digital astrophotography and stacking. First, without enough photons, a photosite can stay at zero, and stacking of zeros just gives you a zero, even though light did hit that photosite. Two, stacking non-zero photosites by adding values can quickly lead to overflow and blowing out. So stacking images isn't so much about adding them together to make a brighter image, it's really about noise control. Stacking images to fill in the noise gaps that you find in a typical astrophotography image. Now before we go back to San Gregorio, let's look at the strategy. I'll be taking 400 light frames. Now light frames are just what they call photos of the thing that you're shooting. So in this case it would be the Andromeda Galaxy itself. So I'll be taking 400 of those for a deep sky stacker to stack up. Now in order to help reduce noise, it helps to take dark frames as well, and deep sky stacker can process those. Dark frames are with your camera set up to the exact same exposure settings and the exact same camera temperature as your light frames. So typically I just shoot uh, between 20 and 30 dark frames right after I take the light frames. Um, but all I do is I put the lens cap on the camera. But everything else, exposure length, ISO, it all stays the same. And it's important to make sure you take it at <clears throat> about the same time that you took the light frame so that your camera's at the same temperature because noise varies with temperature. And then the last thing I'll be doing is taking what are called bias frames. Now again, this is the camera at the same settings except the exposure becomes the fastest shutter speed that you can set on your camera, which is, in the case of the 5D Mark II, is one eight thousandths of a second. Everything else is the same, you just bang, 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 take these shots at the fastest shutter speed. So what these are meant for is to, for Deep Sky Stacker to detect hot pixels, basically. Uh, noise caused by the camera circuitry. So by stacking up all of these, the light frames, dark frames, and bias frames, you get the least noisy picture possible. Now there are a couple of other kinds of frames you can take, um, but I never bother with them. There are light frames, which I believe are used to take care of vignetting, things like that. But again, I just never bother with those. So let's go back to San Gregorio and start taking those photos.
Okay, the strategy for tonight, once the stars come out, is I'm going to take uh, about 400 shots of the Andromeda Galaxy at uh, 1.6 seconds each. That will assure me that I won't have uh, any effective motion blur from the stars. And by adding up about 400 of these images, I'll effectively have a total of about five minutes worth of images uh, to stack with. So hopefully that'll work out, and once the stars come out, I'll begin that process. I just finished taking 400 shots of the uh, uh, Andromeda Galaxy, and I was just manually tracking it every 20 shots or so. So now I'm ready to take, so those are the light frames. So now I'm ready to take the dark frames. I'll take 20 of them with the exact same settings that I took the light frames, but I'm gonna put the lens cap on. And so now I'll take 20 of them and then I'll be ready for the bias frames. Okay, so I just now took 20 of the dark frames with the lens cap on. Now I'm gonna change the setting to the fastest shutter speed on this camera, which is one eight thousandth of a second. And now I'll take 20 more frames and this will be over before you know it. So here we go, I'm gonna to try to keep count. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Okay. It ran into some buffering issues near the end, but that's fine. It doesn't make any difference. So that's it. I got all the frames I need. You have the light frames, the dark frames, and the bias frames. And so now I can just go home and feed this all into a Deep Sky Stacker and let's see what we get. I imported all my... Um light frames, dark frames, and bias frames onto my computer. And so now it's time to have Deep Sky Stacker have a crack at it. So like I said, this is a Windows only program. So here I am in XP. I've never bothered to, bothered to upgrade because I don't use Windows that much. But um, here we go, Deep Sky Stacker. And let's let that launch. And this isn't the most intuitive user interface, but it gets the job done. in it. I tried some others stacking software and this is the easiest that I've seen. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is open the light frames. And to do that, we go to open picture files here. And here I divided this up into folders. Let's go up one directory. The bias dark and light frames. So let's look at our light frames. Make sure I'm in the right one. All right, I'm in the right one. Okay, so the first thing we need is to open all our light frames. And I took 400 of them, so let's just click on one end, shift click on the other. So that's 400, and now we say open. So this is gonna take a little while, so I'll cut forward to when it finishes. Okay, so all of our light frames have loaded, and this is the list. And you can see we can scroll through all 400. Now pay attention to this line here, light frames, zero. Now why is it zero? It's actually telling you how many light frames are checkmarked. In other words, uh, which light frames do you want us to use, or do you want it to use? So we have to check mark all of these, and the easiest way to do that is to select the top one, scroll down to the bottom, select the bottom, then right click on any one of them and say check. And so now you can see they're all checkmarked light frames, 400 checkmarked light frames. So now let's load up the dark frames. So let's go up here, say dark files, and you can see up here there's a uh, preview window. And you notice you don't see much. That's interesting, isn't it? But it, the image is actually there. It says really, really dark. So let's uh, load up the dark files. We'll click on that. Here's our dark files, and we had like 20 of them or so. So let's open those. This should be a lot quicker and it'll load into this uh, list down here, uh, right along with the light frames. So if we scroll down to the bottom, we now see dark frames. They're already checked by default. I'm not sure why the light frames aren't checked by default, but there you go. And last, we'll load in the bias frames. So it's where it says offset bias files, select that. We're in the bias directory, select all of them, and it'll load down here below the dark frames and let's uh, wait a bit there we go 
And so these are the light frames. Scroll down here, and there you see bias frames. So now we see it took 400 light frames, 21 dark frames, and 19 bias frames. So my count was a little bit off, but that's okay. And so now we go to the left menu again and go to register checked pictures. Select that. Now normally this is unchecked. Let's uncheck that. Um, it's only checked there because I've already run this once. But uh, you should leave it unchecked. And the first thing I do is make sure it can see stars. If it can't see stars, it can't align the images. So let's go to this advanced tab and click compute the number of detected stars. And this is going to take a little bit. And you can see it counted 121 stars, which is plenty. There's some cases where you'll see that count at zero. In that case, don't even get started because it's not going to be able to do anything. Let's uh, take a peek at recommended settings. And the first time you run these, you'll have a lot of links. And generally, just click on a lot of them. <laughs> I don't really know the right formula for this. I just pretty much click random things until there's basically not much left to click. Um, so I can't offer you much help there. Now look at stacking parameters. There, I can be a little help. So you get all these tabs. I normally do standard mode for uh, how it places them together, meaning it'll only select the picture that covers all the pictures you took. And anything, any frames that fall outside of the intersection of all the frames, uh, just get cut off, so that's fine. Uh, the other two options aren't bad. I also select two times drizzle. You have to be really, really careful because this uses a lot of memory, this drizzle option. But I found it does make better images, so it's worth it to give it a try. Uh, but you'll definitely, like on my machine with four gigabytes, it just wasn't enough. When I upgraded to eight, then it was okay. So it takes a lot. It also takes a lot of disk space. Uh, let's verify. Let's look at light frames. I normally do median kappa sigma clipping and the DSS website actually has detailed explanations for all of this. A little too detailed for me. I didn't really understand very much of it. So dark frames just do the same thing. Bias offset frames. Alignment automatic. Intermediate files. Uh, I use TIFF. Uh, yeah, I never do anything with that. Make sure your temporary file is a good directory with plenty of space, especially if you use the drizzle option. Cosmetic, I leave those turned off. And output, where do you want the output file? Now this one I am going to change uh, to a file system on my Mac. Uh, let's see, where is that? Probably in here, yeah. So I know this drive has plenty of space. Let's wait for it to load. Okay, and then I have this folder I set up called Deep Sky Temp. So that's all set. Let's say OK. Now, next thing is I'm going to cancel because remember I said this uh, uh, drizzle option takes a lot of memory? We actually need to cut it down a little bit by selecting, just click here, selecting this one called two times, which will reduce the size of the area we'll process and reduce the amount of memory by a lot. And we're just going to guess where the Andromeda Galaxy is. I know I tried to make it in the middle, so hopefully it's in there. And let's go back to register check pictures. Let's make sure everything's set the way I want again. Sorry about that. I don't think I changed much. All right, deep sky temp. DSS temp, so that all works just fine. And now we'll say OK. And OK. Gives you a last summary. I normally just ignore this. And we'll say OK. And now it's starting this process. It's going to take, I don't know, probably five or six hours. Uh, right now it's 11 p.m. My computer is going to be locked up doing this for a while. So I'm just going to go to bed, and I'll see you in the morning to see what came out. Well, it's the next morning now, and so let's see how we did. And we can see the result, and it looks mostly black. Well, what happened? This is actually normal. Remember, stacking is not about making things brighter. It's about making things less noisy. 
if we just took one shot and ended up with this and made it bright, we would just it would just end up lost in a sea of noise. But let's see how we did here. Um, it gives you these three tabs that let you adjust the image. So what I usually do, I don't know if this is all that great a way to do it, but first thing I normally do is here's a histogram and you can see everything is way down at the deep end and here's the response curve and you see it's dark because everything is in this low area here so what we need to do <coughs> or what I do is I link the settings which uh, this is the RGB tab and so what I do is I normally just bring these sliders down which spreads out this data a little bit and then I move this middle slider to move this out to the right a little bit Okay, we don't see any change because you don't see change until you click apply. <clears throat> but let's go to the luminance section. And this is where you can adjust the curves. This is the low end, the high end, and the midtones. And you can adjust the level and the angle of the curve here. So you can see we need to raise this up in this middle part here. So let's grab the slider. Oh, wrong way. So move it up. Now let's see how we're doing when we click apply. And well, there's our galaxy. Now the back part is still a little too light. Now I'm going to fix this up in Photoshop afterwards, so it doesn't have to be perfect here. It just has to be good enough. So since that's the case, let's take this darkness slider and drive it out. I'll just max it out here. You can see it makes a really sharp turn here and then the data comes up. Let's see what we get with this uh, up slider. I guess that's fine. Maybe raise this up a little. See what we do. It's still drawing, but you can click apply. Uh, we ended up with a even brighter background. Let's see if we can tone that down a little. Let's change the angle of the midtones and then drive it to the right a little bit. Give that a try. That should look a little better. And it does. So, this will be... Oh, you can start to see the dust lanes in the galaxy now. So that's good. I think this is at a good enough level that we can uh, start processing it in Photoshop. So, uh, what we have to do there is save picture to file. So click that. And it's okay. It hasn't redrawn it totally. <clears throat> It'll redraw it when it saves it. Uh, we'll just save it in this DSS temp, and I'll just use this existing file name. Now, I save it twice. Uh, once as a 16-bit TIFF, and once as a 32-bit rational TIFF, uh, which I almost never use. But just in case it's useful, I'll do that. Uh, we'll apply adjustments to the saved image, and we'll click Save. And it's going to take a little while because it's still redrawing it with the new response curves. Now you see it saving the image. I, actually, I should have called it 16, not 32. Oh well. Okay, now let's save it again. Once it's done with this. Okay, save this time a 32-bit image. Rational. And I'll just call this real 32. And click save. Okay, now the image is images are saved. It's the same image, one is a 16-bit, one is a 32-bit. So now let's go to Photoshop. I've imported the 16-bit image into Photoshop Lightroom. Now I said before Photoshop, I actually meant Lightroom. The reason I use Lightroom is because it has really good noise reduction tools. Now, well, didn't I say stacking was to avoid noise? Yes, it is, but these are really dim objects we're dealing with, so noise is still an issue. So here's the raw image. So first thing I'm going to do is focus down upon this uh, galaxy here by rotating it a little. Uh, for those of you oops, familiar with the uh, Mac OS X Lion desktop screen, that's actually what you're looking at is the Andromeda Galaxy. So, okay. Now you can see it's pretty noisy, so Let's clean that up with the noise slider. And you'll have to be pretty heavy on that, and that's looking pretty good. And now let's uh, <coughs> see what we can do. Maybe, first of all, 
eliminate this area which is causing this gray background. So we can do that with the black slider. So that's looking good. Nice. Let's do a little fill light which sort of undoes that. Not too much because that's going to bring up the noise. Bring that down a little and this is just all a matter of trade-offs. Bring up the overall brightness. That's looking good. Let's maybe make it not quite so yellow looking. And I haven't experimented too much with uh, uh, colors in uh, Deep Sky Stacker yet. So that's an inter interesting area to look at. And I would say that's looking pretty good. Let's see if we were too heavy on the noise reduction. And uh, yeah, maybe about there is about right. So there you go. I'm going to call that finished right now. You'll see much, much better images of the Andromeda Galaxy all over the place. The key to those, though, was that they were done with longer exposures. This is a stack of 1.6 uh, second exposures. And so there's only so much you can do with that. So, and you may say, well, it's still a pretty noisy image, and it is. Did we really need stacking? Well, let's compare that with the original image, which I'll bring up now. Okay, this is one of the 400 images that I took. And you can see the Andromeda Galaxy is right in there. So let's crop way down on that. All right. Let me rotate it. Let's see what we can do with this image. Uh, first of all, I don't think I need to fill in the blacks, but I do need to set the brightness. And maybe some fill. Oh, we're getting lots of noise there. You can already see we're not getting anywhere near what I had with stacking. Uh, let's set noise reduction. Okay, well, that's a lot better. And let's again set the fill light, the brightness, more fill. Yeah, I, you know, we're really not going anywhere with this. This is not a usable image. It just looks like a fuzzy star. So that's the benefit of stacking. <clears throat> stacking is a great thing. Uh, if you stack longer exposure images, either by tracking or by having a wider uh, field of view, you know, zooming out your camera, then uh, you can do a longer exposures and a brighter image. I did try with a wider field of view. Uh, instead of this 280 millimeters, using 200 millimeters, I just found the galaxy was just too small in the viewfinder. 200 millimeters is not that big for something that's one degree of arc, which is interestingly twice the diameter of the moon. And you know how small the moon is in photographs with even a 200 millimeter lens. So let's go back. Here's the image that we got with stacking and after processing in Lightroom. And I'd say it's one of the best astrophotography photos I've ever taken. So, you know, as a kid, you would have seen my bookshelves were lined with books on astronomy, which had all these incredible photographs from Palomar and Yerkes and Lick Observatories. And I'd always wanted to make photos like that. And well, I may not quite be there yet, but I'm getting pretty close. So that's sort of the fulfillment of a dream here. And uh, I hope you'll be able to take great uh, astrophotography photos with the help of this video too. And uh, hopefully maybe you'll be able to teach me things about Deep Sky Stacker. So thanks a lot for watching, and I'll talk to you next time.